quarter. So nothing to cheer about just yet, since I'm still on company time, even though I'm sitting in a empty apartment in Fargo. Uh, can everybody hear me? Just nod. Just do you know the usual, yeah, whatever kind of thing. Um, I'll stop my video uh, to save bandwidth. I've learned that that helps when you do things like this. So there I go. And then we'll get into the presentation. Um, like I said, it's almost five o'clock somewhere. Um, oh, darn it. Okay, this program, this part of the program is brought to you by, uh, you know, e-cards. And the reason I'm, I put this slide in is, you know, rye is the darling of the cover crop industry. And because it basically is half a step away of, from being a weed, it's, it's very easy to establish. It's the most drought tolerant. Uh, it's the most winter hardy, uh, pretty vigorous growth in the spring. Uh, and so a lot, of, a lot of work has gone over the years in, um, exploiting those attributes for, in a way, capturing nitrate runoff. And this is a graph from Southeast Minnesota. Uh, and in Minnesota, we, especially after soybeans and corn, we don't have enough growth in the fall before uh, hell freezes over around here. And in the spring, if we have a later spring, especially if it gets late, established very late, the reduction in the nitrate concentrations uh, through drain tile, and a lot of ground in Southern Minnesota these days has been tiled, just is not that great. So I got back into rye simply because of the demand for rye seed for cover crops. And that was one of the biggest purveyors of rye both organic and conventional is Albert Lee Seedhouse, who operates also, I think, all the way into Michigan, all the way up to the East Coast. Um, asking, Mac Earhart asked me, he said, well, which variety should I grow for seed production? I can sell as much as I want, but I have to produce it first. And so in the fall of 14, I scrounged up any rye that I could find and reestablished the variety trial. And so that included Renza Bruzzi from you know, University of Georgia, Florida, um, Elbon, Oakland, Maton from the Noble Foundation, uh, Maton too was in there too, uh, Wheeler Spooner, um, all the Canadian ones, Remington, Hazlitt, uh, Prima. But I, because I grew up in uh, the Netherlands, and no breeders, because uh, I got trained as a breeder, plant breeder at Wageningen University. And I knew folks that were in triticale and in rye, and I knew about hybrid ryes. Um, there's two major uh, German breeding companies that produce hybrid rye and one Polish, uh, Danko basically, uh, what, of what we know as Danko here. And so I approached both uh, German companies, KWS, who is now retailing it in the US and then the other one, their main competitor in, in Europe called Southern Union or SU, if they were interested in testing this material also in the US. Now KWS had started a little bit in that time in Canada already in the east, uh, uh, Eastern provinces and uh, was with Mark Sorrells uh, testing it at, in New York State at Cornell. And so I started basically recreating the ride trial and that has led to all kinds of fun things, um, including Paul, who's talking about Ryan a little bit, uh, distillers. Uh, I have a project looking at the taste of individual varieties and some of that work is now also being done in your neck of the woods um, to uh, Shanae Simsek at NDSU, who is um, the, normally the spring wheat or the wheat quality person at NDSU looking at rye. And so, the, and now um, one of the largest uh, integrated 
uh, hog operations uh, called Pipestone Systems, which is a bunch of independent growers in a way creating a pipeline, uh, looking at rise of feed, uh, feed stuff to replace corn. Now, when we're talking rye, the first thing you have to recognize, it's really adapted to northern latitudes. It's a very long, long day species. It's 18 hour plus, uh, and it, it's very daylight sensitive. So when you move it south, um, and really very much south, and it's south, more south than Minnesota, um, you now and then get some surprises. Uh, one of those could be a delay in heading and maturity. Now, the U.S. material, like Oakland, et cetera, which were bred in Oklahoma, obviously have been selected to not do that. But those were also grazing types. And the stuff for the northern deers, you know, the, the Canadian material as well as Wheeler, Spooner, uh, Ryman from Minnesota, were selected here, but the German stuff is all selected further, you know, latitude wise further north. And so I, one of the things was, okay, will these hybrids work here? Um, and so far the answer is, yeah, very well actually. Um, to get happy rye, you need reasonably well-drained soils, but especially if you wanna have very high productivity they need to be able to hold some water and fertility. So when you go to the real sandboxes with no water holding capacity, I would not put the hybrid rise on it because it's not worth the investment. You're not gonna get the productivity out of it. Uh, you can stay with the older open pollinated varieties. You'd have to have just a reasonable fall establishment. Um, we have some work to do especially on the rye side with what is the optimum seeding rate in relationship to seeding date. Because if you establish it really early, it will tiller and tiller and tiller until it's thicker than hair on a dog. Um, and you probably, you don't need to have it that many tillers. Um, Early springs really help rye to flourish. When that spring starts in March rather than in uh, on March 1st rather than May 1st, you see huge differences in, in performance. And it was interesting, Ryan, uh, I, I shared a, a YouTube video that we shot this summer with Ryan. And because I knew I was on the road, I actually asked him if that was a good idea to play. And, one of his comments was, God, your rye is a lot shorter than it is in our neck of the woods. That's the difference in a good spring. If we have an earlier spring in Minnesota, which in Kirkston, which is only 90 miles from the Canadian border, and we had a long winter last year with lots and lots of snow. Um, we had a really late spring, some snow, you know, some blizzards in mid of April you have a very quick transition from vegetative to reproductive growth and the crop stays short, maybe up to my hips. Uh, so you're in that three and a half feet at the most. You have an earlier spring. I've, I've been in uh, plots with uh, Spooner and Wheeler that were over my head and I'm 6'4". Um, the other thing that makes happy, rye happy is a little bit drier weather and a little bit lower dew points during pollination and grain fill. Um, rye will shed its pollen um, and it's beautiful to see actually because it, it's, you can, it's actually more visible almost than, than corn pollination. But if you just, just as the sun rises till about probably seven o'clock, 7.30 on a, on a nice sunny morning, you'll see the, this whole cloud of pollen floating over the rye fields. Um, you get good seed set, have less problems with, um, with ergot, and then less problems down the road with fusarium head blight. And that's why I'm asking for slightly drier weather and a little bit lower dew points, a little bit cooler nights seems to help. 
So field selection, like I said, reasonably well drained. Don't put your hybrids on the, you know, your true sandboxes. Don't ever put corn, uh, rye after corn. Assume for now, and I'll come back to that, all, that all the hybrids and all the OPs are susceptible to fusarium head blight. Um, probably avoid heavily manured fields simply because of uh, excess nitrogen will lead to more lodging. And more and more, uh, we because our herbicide programs, especially in corn and beans, have gotten a little bit more complicated with herbicide resistant weeds, uh, most uh, extension weed specialists in the upper Midwest now talk about you know, a layered approach with at least one or two herbicides that have residual soil activity. That can lead to some interesting problems. And, and the most telling one is I was had a trial that was on um, sweet corn ground where the grower had established the cover crop of oats, which we always think of as being pretty susceptible to most herbicides and the oat cover crop looked beautiful. We cut the oat cover crop, made a seed bed, planted the rye trial in it, looked beautiful, um, but it was a little bit cooler. And in three weeks afterwards, and checking on stands, I had half a trial. Half the plots had come up and the other half had not. And the only thing we can trace it back to, and the rye was worse than the adjacent winter wheat trial. The only thing we can trace it back to is the prowl H2O applied on the corn ground, on the, on the sweet corn. We were well within the replant restriction or outside the replant restriction. The dose shouldn't have been a problem, but, and we didn't think of anything because the oats was happy. Uh, which normally would have shown carryover issues as well. But the physiology of cooler growing conditions, um, just having enough residue there, we ran into trouble. So you really need to understand your herbicide history uh, to avoid carryover problems. And I'll skip this. So I, I'm in Minnesota. I'm really trying to push the growers to, in a way, establish late. I don't want to set up the green bridge where we transmit, uh, for instance, barley yellow dwarf virus, or we start to transmit wheat streak mosaic virus, or some, you know, some other things we don't know about yet. And the best way to do that is uh, plant a little bit later and make sure that you don't have volunteer wheat or barley in that field. What we need to learn yet is indeed that relationship between seeding rate and planting date, which is important, especially for the hybrid drive because of the seed cost, and the relationship with fall fertility management, spring fertility management, and yield potential. Our experience has been to date, and we've been trying to get grant funding for this, we just haven't been successful yet, um, probably because we don't put the right buzzwords in it in the grant application. Um, that if you do everything in the spring and you have this late spring and this crop transitions very quickly to reproductive growth, uh, it doesn't seem that it's doing so well. Our yields are then, those are the locations where I have just poor, poor performance overall in comparison to where I had fall applied fertilizer, everything fall applied which you know, then brings up some issues about, okay, what is the potential for leaching, et cetera, and, and runoff. And that, that's why we need to do this work yet. So the guidelines in Minnesota, you can look this up. Um, basically, in a way are out of date because uh, our yield potent, expected yield potential is well above 80. We think actually that the hybrids might be slightly more efficient with nitrogen, but we just need to do this work. So for now, we, we stick with these end guidelines. And for Michigan, they should be completely different than these because you know your soils are different, your climatic conditions are different, etc. P guidelines, same. Um, 
rye is pretty efficient if you compare it to corn and beans and wheat. Okay, the same way, a lot of our soils have uh, soil tests above 120. So even for winter hardiness, uh, we don't necessarily <laughs> think we need any um, uh, potash fertilizer. Um, if you do, you can ban some with the seed and we have general recommendations for that. And I'm pretty sure Michigan has too. So planting depth, I still like to do it the same way I do for small grains. Don't go deeper than an inch and a half. I'd like to have that crop up relatively quick, uh, need good seed to soil contact. Um, you can plant a lot deeper because the subcrown inner node and the length of co-optal are much, much longer than that of wheat, barley, and oats. So if you look at coleoptile length, generally they're very well correlated with plant height, and they're about double of that are of the tallest spring wheat. So Wheeler nine, has a nine inch coleoptile. Uh, my beakers weren't, weren't tall enough. In my paper, um, my germination paper rolls weren't tall enough. Um, that's how far the coleoptile came out. Uh, the other ones are a little bit more reasonable with Ryman and you know Danko and Remington all right around six inches. So in the fall, like I said, we tried to avoid that green bridge. And before it goes dormant, before hell freezes over, I think the only thing you really have to look for is probably powdery mildew, um, especially in our area. The leaf rust, if, the, if you avoid the green bridge, shouldn't be there. And I haven't seen a lot of the tan spots of Floria complex at all in the fall. I see a little bit of it in the spring. Uh, but it's, if, there, if there's going to be problems, it's probably going to be powdery mildew. And then for the latter part of the growing season, if you're in a conventional system, um, I want you to actively scout again for powdery mildew in the spring. And there is varietal differences between all these varieties. Uh, I haven't had enough reliable repeatable data to say this one is much better than the other. Likewise, I have the same problem with leaf rust. I can find it in certain years, uh, certain locations, but I don't, I haven't had enough repeated data to really sign ratings to them, but there is some differences between all the genetics. What I've half found is that for now, I consider all of them susceptible to Fusarium head blight. Um, and it wasn't, it was thanks to some work that Chet Lee did in Kentucky with a grad student and that we have some data now, especially KWS um, did not want us to even explore this because uh, they're very worried about seed set uh, and the use of fungicides. Uh, and us being us, Chat Lee and I said, let's just get the data first and then we'll go from there. And so he summarized his research and I put it in this, in this blog post, uh, basically summarized it for the growers in Minnesota. Uh, you can also search Chat Lee's article about it. I think he has it as a blog post somewhere too, about how you should use Idacarambo and Moravis Ace at pollination to suppress scab. And that's important because if it doesn't go in a still, um, it most likely will end up as a feed somewhere or even as a, in the malt, uh, Don is an issue. So if it can't make grade on a food grade application, it's more than likely gonna go as feed and that probably will be swine and they're very sensitive to DON. And so we need to make sure that if we raise rye, we do it best way possible to avoid uh, dunk uh, contamination. The fungicides, by the way, don't control ergot, unfortunately. But ergot, you know, with modern color sorters can be virtually eliminated. So this is the fun part. I always express uh, yield as a percent of the location average. Um, 
in this past year, 2020, we had a, a wide range of, of performances. Uh, La Center was a very good location, averaging just over 110 bushels per acre. Becker, our sandbox, um, 20 bushels an acre, just over 20 bushels an acre. You can still see that the hybrids, uh, the KWS hybrids are the only ones in the trials left nowadays. Southern Union decided not to commercialize in the US at this point in time. <coughs> Sorry. You can still see there's heterosis, probably about you know, 20, 25% heterosis over the best open pollinated, which is Denko or and in, in this case in Becker. If you look at uh, this really good location, uh, La Center, which is just about an hour south of the Twin Cities area. This is a nice um, sandy loam ground, uh, no standing water, anything. You're looking at somewhere around, you know, 40% heterosis over, uh, over Denko, and you're looking at yields in 140 plus range uh, on a per field basis. The best I heard in commercial fields is anywhere from 120 to 140 uh, in the south and from 100 to 120 in northern Minnesota uh, up to through up through last year. Um, so in the state, you know, we I expect the open pollinated varieties to be in that 80 to 90, the best ones. And, Ryman, Hazlitt, and now Denko, which I included uh, three years ago for the first time, um, are probably the most all around OPs. Uh, Ryman and uh, Wheeler, uh, often like Spooner and Wheeler, just get too tall in Minnesota. Uh, Musketeers, likewise, not the greatest. Dylan, too tall. Uh, I would expect that to do the get way too tall in uh, Michigan as well. Um, has yeah, like I said, has Hazlitt, Ryman, and Danko are probably the most all around OPs on the hybrids. Tayo is going to be their next one, and I think most people probably have seen Brissetto and Bono, and Bono by now is a 13 year old hybrid. Tayo is got released, I think, two years ago in Germany. So they're still making uh, good progress in Germany, and we're starting to test that material earlier now in the US. So summary, I think rye is viable as a grain crop, not simply a, you know, a cover crop, especially if it's on a bit more marginal ground that runs out of water uh, for full season crops uh, like corn and soybeans. Still have to have water holding capacity, but you know, for full season crops like corn, where a lot of water use starts and you have some winter recharge, I think rye is a very good fit. I still would consider no-till uh, or having stubble remaining desirable. I think soybeans is ideal as a previous crop, but you have to know the herbicide history. And you need some vigilance to avoid problems. Um, and that includes, you know, knowing what the previous crop is, be willing to use fungicides, um, avoid that green bridge uh, to be successful. With that, I'll stop sharing my screen. I'll start the video. And I'll probably use way too much time because I see Paul is in the wings already but I'll try to answer questions if they're right now, and otherwise I'll just stick around and answer them later. Awesome, thank you very much, Joachim. Uh, we got two questions in the chat, so we'll start with those. Uh, first one is from Vince. Um, what method of sorting uh, best removes ergot? You mentioned optical, but within that, is there, uh, is there a uh, I am not the engineer here, <laughs> but I know it's being, being done. Uh, KWS actually has bought a mobile unit uh, for people that indeed process right to help them remove the ergot. So I can ask the folks at KWS what they bought. That doesn't mean it's the best one, but um, 
there is ways to remove ergot that way. Gravity table gets you a long ways, but doesn't get you completely to zero because there's, you know, the sclerosia are just the right size. Some of them are just the right size. They just, they don't make the cutout on the, on the gravity table. Um, the second question is from Michael. Uh, what are the impacts of powdery mildew on yield and quality in rye? So powdery mildew is, is a fiend for nitrogen. Uh, a crop that is very lush with vegetative growth has the greatest chance of getting powdery mildew, especially if it's a little bit protected from wind because powdery mildew needs a little bit more leaf wetness period to get going. But if you have a thick canopy, um, what it will do is, uh, event, if it stays around long enough, and, and so powdery mildew kind of shuts down by the time you get to 85 degrees, but if it lower in that lower canopy, if it stays more, uh, cool enough, um, it sucks out a lot of the nitrates. And that's where the yield impact comes. You will notice it first in test weight and then in overall yield. And how much depends on how long you let it stay around and if it gets warm or not. Because once it gets 85 degrees or warmer, powdery mildew in a way shuts down. And the way you can see that is if you if if you look at the powdery mildew, normally the the you know the the fungus grows on the outside and it gets that fuzzy gray appearance. The mycelia is gray. When it turns kind of a tan color, it's stalling out. Uh, interesting. Uh, Paul, are, are you ready to go with your slides? Uh, you're on mute, Paul. Well, while Paul tries to figure out, ah, he has it. Okay, we'll come back to Vincent's question later. Oh, no, go go ahead. Okay, Vincent, how early? Who? Are, how early is too early? Right now, I tell growers in southern Minnesota really not to go before September 15th. I have some growers that want to start September 1st. Um, they're in an area that for some reason catches a rain September 1st and then they turn dry for a month until they're all the way into October. And I'm really trying to push them not to go before September 1st and or September 15th in southern Min. In Northern Minnesota, I don't want it to start uh, before September 1st. My trials uh, across the state are put in exactly two weeks later. So I start in uh, Northern Minnesota on the 15th, somewhere around there. And I'll try to get my Southern locations in on October 1st. I I've gone as late as October 10th. So they're, they're relatively narrow windows because it's a continental climate. I don't know when winter comes. And in some years, it grows all the way through the middle of November, past deer season here. Um, a, a one killing frost does not stall rye. It just, the moment it warms up, it keeps going. That's different than winter wheat that after the first killing frost, winter wheat just kind of goes dormant, rye doesn't, it keeps going. Okay, Paul, I'll shut up, it's yours. All right, we'll see if this works now. Okay, um, Ryan, I think you need to share with me or enable me to share. All right. All right, your co-host now. I don't know why it keeps reverting. So you should be permitted now. Ah, excellent. Beautiful. Okay. Um, is this is this working? Uh, it's. It's working, but you're back out of presentation mode now. Oh, okay. So start the slides, just wait. 
Well, okay. All I'm seeing is the presentation, but um, it's, you guys are seeing it. Mm -hmm. Yep. Looks good. Okay. Um, so I don't have um, a lot of information here. Um, and as I, I titled this talk, it's just some of our observations on, on malting rye and rye malt quality. Um, so why are we talking about rye malt? I, th I think most of us are pretty familiar. I mean, there's historically, um, there's, you know, uh, in brewing, there's been a little bit Rogan beer in Germany, of course, rye and malt, uh, rye malt whiskeys, as well as a few other beverages. Um, but, you know, certainly the last 10 or maybe a little more years, we've really seen a resurgence of interest. Um, I think this is, you know, it's likely flavor driven. Um, I found a, you know, a popular press um, article about 10 years ago that, you know, it's every brewery produces a wheat beer, a pale ale, a stout, and now it seems that everyone's making a rye beer. Um, I think over past years, we've seen incorporation of rye into some, you know, traditional styles. You know, we think like rye IPA. Uh, as far as our background working with rye, um, I would say, you know, a little after 2010, uh, we started getting questions on, you know, which variety, um, you know, we're interested in malting rye, which variety should we be uh, using. And of course, we really didn't have much of an idea. Uh, so we began working with Yoakum um, and some others with the 2014 crop uh, to take a look at rye malt quality. Um, and then for Aaron here, um, rye also was the focus of, I think, the last farmer uh, brewer winter weekend uh, this one was held at, at Hartwick uh, College and Farmer Brewer was really kind of the predecessor uh, to the Craft Malt Conference. Uh, so again, like I said, we began um, working with samples in the 2014 crop and we malted the 2014, 2015 and kind of as an afterthought, I said, you know, we should really run Don on the malts. And we did this and we were amazed. Um, you know, we had samples at like 40 PPM Don. So uh, looking at those in terms of malt quality was kind of out of the question. Um, it was about 80% of a hundred some samples we had collected. So uh, the few good samples we had, we did some work on just looking at how we should micro malt. Um, rye uh, compared to what we were doing with barley. And then it was with the 2016 and 2017 crops um, that um, we started to collect data. So our trial locations and our cooperators, uh, of course, Yoakum, who you just heard from, um, had three locations and sorry if I didn't get them quite in the right place on the map, but um, at NDSU Carrington, we worked with Steve Swinger um, and then in Ithaca with Mark Sorrells, um, had two locations in New York. Uh, so we had three states, um, North Dakota, just 2016, uh, nine varieties that were grown in conventional and organic plots. Uh, Minnesota, we had two years, 16 varieties at three separate locations. Uh, and then New York, we had 12 varieties at two locations. So kind of the problem we had here is this wasn't a uniform nursery. Uh, we were just taking varieties from different trials. Uh, not all were grown in all states and the design is, is pretty un unbalanced. And as such, um, in our evaluation, um, we're really making observations more on rye type rather than specific genotypes. So in terms of, of type, um, 
uh, and it was actually Yoakum worked with me on, on helping to categorize these, basically reflects the primary intended use of the variety. Um, so the open pollinated grain types were conventional varieties uh, that are largely utilized uh, for grain. The ones we call dual purpose um, that I abbreviated DP, which um, maybe wasn't the best uh, abbreviation, but anyway, again, open pollinated uh, varieties that were mainly maybe developed for cr cover crop, but are, are sometimes grown for grain. And then um, as a separate category, we had the hybrids and the hybrids are really largely grown for food or feed grain. So this is just a list of um, cultivars in the study. And then um, the states and the number of entries we had. So for open pollinated, dual purpose, Arushtuk, um, Dylan, Gardner, Spooner, and Wheeler. Uh, the types we felt that were more so uh, grain types were Hazlitt, Dackel, Danko, and so forth. Um, and then in terms of the hybrids, the hybrids were just out of the Minnesota and New York trials. And we had materials from both uh, KWS and from Sutton Union. So talked a little with, with Ryan and, and Aaron on this. And I guess when I, I started this project, you know, I worked with barley my whole life and my mindset was kind of, you know, you know, we have a, a strict definition of quality, but, you know, as we look at rye, there's not a lot in the literature. Um, there was some work done quite a few years ago at Vine Stefan. Um, I think with the increasing craft use and local grains, maybe we're kind of making a new definition. And as I was putting together this talk, um, I just did a web search. So I, I went to eight North American maltsters and just looked at their online product specs. And there's quite a bit of variation. And just for an example, you know, on malt protein, we had anywhere from nine up to 14% for rye malt available on the market. So, you know, as I thought about this, you know, quality is probably largely defined by the user, the brewer, the, the distiller, and then the product they're using it in. And, you know, why, why are we using rye? And of course, it's because of its unique flavor. So flavor is really the driver. Um, and when we look at malt quality requirements, you know, maybe these are, are really less strict or less important than for barley malt. Um, so, you know, I, I think, you know, we want reasonable extract, um, good plumpness, and not necessarily in terms of it being correlated with extract, but um, there are rye, rye genotypes out there that have very, very thin grain. And I mean, certainly we don't want something that's, you know, so thin that it's not um, all of it's going to be retained, you know, on the malt floor. Um, and then the brewer too doesn't want something that's so small, it's difficult to grind. Uh, reasonable enzyme levels. And I think, you know, most of us are aware uh, Rye is really high in penizans or arabinozylans. It's very difficult um, to louder. So in that variety um, or sample selection, you know, viscosity might might too be a, an issue. So take a few minutes here and just look at some of the quality, but um, the open pollinated varieties generally had the highest plumpness. So if we look at Minnesota, we see it was significantly higher than the hybrids or the dual purpose. Um, North Dakota environment plumpness was, was much lower, but the open pollinated uh, were slightly, not significantly, but were slightly better. And then in New York, we saw the, the same thing with the open pollinated is plumper. Um, in terms of protein, 
Uh, the dual purpose um, varieties were significantly higher in protein. We saw this in Minnesota, um, and we also saw it in North Dakota. Um, the hybrids um, tended towards uh, lower protein, and this was significant both in New York and in Minnesota. And interestingly, we did not see a strong relationship between plump and protein in any of the states. Um, extract, um, we look here in this column, uh, was significantly higher in the open pollinated grain types and hybrids. Um, it was lowest in uh, the dual purpose types. Um, and probably the being lower in those dual purpose types is extract was was really strongly associated with protein. Um, in terms of wort soluble protein, S over T, uh, we saw very high soluble protein levels in S over T. Um, this has been shown in previous studies with rye. It is a characteristic of rye. Uh, some of our numbers here are quite high and a little of that might reflect our malting procedure. But um, looking at soluble protein and fan, um, again, these were highest in the dual purpose, um, but were uh, lower in the hybrids. In terms of enzymes, um, here we look at, at DP, diastatic power, not dual purpose, but um, so we really didn't have a huge range in DP. Um, it was higher in the dual purpose uh, varieties, and this is as diastatic power um, is positively correlated with protein. Um, in terms of genotypic differences in diastatic power, um, we only saw those in uh, the Minnesota trials. Um, alpha amylase, um, rye has previously been reported to have uh, fairly high alpha levels. And we did see this. Um, and uh, if we look both at the New York um, in the Minnesota data, we see the open pollinated grain um, alpha levels were significantly higher than those in uh, the hybrids. But I, you know, a take home message here is didn't seem to be a lot of variation, uh, but you know, there's certainly adequate, you know, enzyme activity there, if maybe not even in the case of alpha, a little excessive. Uh, viscosity, the final quality uh, parameter. Um, you know, we know rye warts have high viscosity. In this study, the mean of all samples was about four. Uh, the range was about th uh, 2.8 uh, up to 6.5. But when we look by type, um, we saw significant differences in Minnesota. But, you know, to be totally honest, I'm not sure whether they're of that great of practical significance. Um, if a 4.4 is going to give you much faster loadering than a, a, a 4.0. Um, the hybrids did trend towards lower viscosity, but like I said, the differences weren't big. Uh, we did see genotypic differences in viscosity, but only in the Minnesota trials. Um, and it's probably due to the fact that there were a lot more entries in, in Minnesota. Um, wort viscosity with rye is attributed, attributed to penizan or arabinoxylan. Um, and we did measure high molecular weight um, arabinoxylan in a subset. 
Um, the differences, however, weren't large, and the relationship between arabinoxylan content and wort viscosity wasn't really strong. Um, this may relate to some of our methodology, but anyway, we did find that the ratio of arabinose to xylose in these arabinoxylans was positively correlated with viscosity. Um, and that was kind of interesting. Um, it somewhat reflects the, the branching of, of the polymer. So in summary, um, acceptable malt, I think, can be produced from most of the open pollinated grain and hybrid types. And this is just looking at ec extract enzymes. Um, you know, again, we didn't have a lot of replication in our study, but there is evidence that most of these traits have some genotypic variation. Um, quality malt production with the dual purpose types might be a little more challenging just because of the higher protein. But <clears throat> I think there's some evidence from the organic trial in North Dakota that shows um, you can get, you can use agronomic practice to, to influence quality. Um, so high wort viscosity is probably a, the biggest challenger to the brewer with rye. Um, there probably is genetic variation there. And we know too that malting practice can influence it. Um, we found raising uh, steep moisture um, reduces viscosity in the final malt. Uh, flavor, again, is probably the big driver. Um, flavor is complex. Um, we know there's flavor differences. Uh, back at the, the Farmer Brewer Winter Weekend in 2016, uh, Chris Anderson uh, from Fargo Brewing uh, made Rogan beers with both Danko and Hazlitt. And as I, I remember, I mean, people that tried these definitely said there were differences. Um, most preferred the Danko, but, but some actually liked the Hazlitt better. And I think, you know, we know there's flavor differences from, from talking with maltsters and brewers. So what contributes to flavor? Um, the figure here is something I, I copied out of a, a thesis from Finland, but they're just saying perceived fly, uh, flavor in rye, volatile compounds, amino acids, sugars, lipids, and phenolics. And, you know, certainly we know with rye that 4-vinyl guaiacol can be important, uh, particularly if we're using uh, yeast that have the phenolic um, off-flavor phenotype. Uh, so like the wheat beer yeasts, uh, ferulic acid from the rye is converted to 4 vinyl guaiacol. Uh, we did measure uh, wort ph phenolics. Uh, with ferulic acid, we didn't see differences, but um, Ryan sent me their study, so I uh, worked on at MSU, and I, I think Aaron probably did some of the analysis, did show there was some variation in 4 vinyl guaiacol. So last slide, um, and Joachim had talked about FHB, but um, those of you that might have attended uh, the Craft Malt Conference, uh, the recent presentation on rye mentioned rye as accumulating lower don than wheat. Um, I was a little skeptical on this, but I did find uh, a few research studies that seemed to support this. Um, but I want to throw out a caution here. Um, even though we don't see much don in the rye, the rye grain can be extensively colonized by fusarium. And if we have that fusarium present in the grain and we go to malt it um, under the right conditions, the don levels can just explode. And um, this is a uh, scanning electron micrograph. It's actually triticale, not rye. Uh, but this is the cab. It's a cross section of the kernel, and this is the central cavity. And we can see here some uh, fungal um, 
hyphae or mycelium. And after this sample was malted, um, we had tremendous growth of fungi inside the kernel. And we see this cavity is almost filled um, with, with hyphae. And that's what we saw back in the 2014, 2015 uh, rye samples was this dramatic increase in Don. So it, it is something that can happen. But anyway, with that, I will stop and take questions. Thank you very much. We have several questions uh, in the chat and we can um, go live with questions too after these are addressed. So the first one uh, is from Tom. If you were to malt rye, how would the shelf life could be compared to malted Thanks. barley? And um, I assume it's all to do with it going slack due to moisture uptake and lack of husk, but um, yeah, and also Aaron, feel, feel free to comment on the shelf life of, of rye malt if you want. I have um, no idea on, oh. on rye versus barley malt. Um, speaking from my experience, rye malt didn't stick around very long uh, because we only malted it to order, but when we carried over inventory of wheat malt, it went slack really, really quickly, especially in warm weather. Um, okay. But probably due to storage conditions as well. Aaron, do you? Uh, I mean, my only experience is in the lab. Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah. In the lab, we, it's amazing how stable functionality is of malt. Right, like we we test samples years later, and the enzymes extract all the same. So I think when it comes to production, you want to be most concerned about moisture, and then the freshness factor. Obviously, there's some loss of volatiles, you know, over time with malting, uh, with malt storage. So I mean, sooner the better, I'm sure, to maximize flavor and freshness. But you know, in my experience, the functionality is, is seems infinitely stable. You, I mean, I would guess in, in any malt, I can't say rye versus barley. I mean, the longer it sits to your, you know, you said loss of volatiles, but you're going to have oxidation and. Uh, all right, there we go. Next question is from Scott. Uh, do you get a lot of wort haze that could contribute to the high color um, in the color metrics you presented about the rye wort? Um, in, in my experience, you know, I think our colors in our study were around four SRM. And rye wort really isn't, you know, with a standard low temperature kiln rye wort, it's not a nice color. Um, it's kind of, I, I'm not sure how I describe it. it it's sort of grayish. Um, and it, it is a little hazy. Yes. It, I agree with the color situation. It's got a very bizarre brown hue. And so it's funny that remember that our color, our SRM color measurement is very one dimensional, right? Just right. measuring the absorbance at 430 nanometers it does not give you a full complement of the way it looks. You know, you know what I'm saying? I don't know anything about color theory, but if you put a four SRM barley malt wort next to a four SRM rye malt wort, they don't look anything the same, right? Because of that, the hue. I mean, we're not, we're not really assessing it the way that it looks. Um, we always include a uh, viscosity reducing enzyme in our rye mashes for our research. And it comes out, they come out brilliantly clear with the, um, when you use like a viscosity reducing enzyme like Ultraflow Max or ViscoFirm or Laminex or one of these. Interesting. Um, yeah, so at 430 nanometers, we're just measuring absorbency and then using that to infer color too. So obviously not anywhere near approaching the complexity that we can see with our eyeballs. Yeah, if you're doing color work, you know, with, with grains, uh, you really need to be doing wavelength scans. You know, and have that whole that whole wavelength scan down so that you know you can look at it later and see you know if there's any. But you know the peak the peak will shift and 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 the baseline will shift and anyway, that's one way to do it. Other people are using tri-stimulus, but um, 
I've never got any good luck with tri stimulus. Um, let's see. Oh, actually, a question from Vince. Uh, what were the difference in descriptors used for flavors in the beer brewed at uh, Farmer Brewer with Danko and Hazlitt? And um, I remember Danko being much higher in Porter VG character, that, you know, uh, characteristic spicy rye that we all think about. Um, but I don't remember much about the way that one brewed with Hazlitt actually tasted. I, you know, I honestly don't remember. It was not a formal flavor evaluation. It was more like um, you'd get a glass of this and that and, oh, I like this one. I don't. Do you remember, Aaron? Gee, you I was were... just going to look and see if I could find the slides. <laughs> Wouldn't that be fun? Oh. I remember well, it being a lot of fun, yeah. <laughs> that was, I mean, I mean, that was at like the happy hour after the sessions, I think. But didn't Chris from Fargo Brewing have some slides? He, he did have a presentation. Um, and I don't know if he talked about those beers per se. I remember him mentioning, you know, a number of kind of like odd Scandinavian beers that he used fried, but um, I, I honestly, I don't recall. I remember him being really adamant about Danko being much more difficult to brew as far as uh, runoff and louder time than Hazlitt was. And I think the malts were, were both from uh, Valley Malt, if I remember correct. Ryan, you want to let me share my screen? I found the slide. Oh, okay. I'll put you up here. Uh, all right, co-host Aaron McLeod. Flashback there. Friday. That's right. Flashback to 2016 February. So this is what um, Vince, if you want to see the descriptors, this is what Chris, who brewed the beers, I guess, at Fargo Brewing Company had in his presentation. Thank you. That's exactly what I was hoping to see. I don't see anything with 4VG really in there. You know, it's everything else. Well, spicy. Is, I just I wanted know. to make sure, you know. Um, spicy. You've got like, uh, wow. Yeah, you got the spiciness versus the no spiciness, right? Wow, that's amazing. Take a screenshot. Press print screen if you want to save this. Oh, I'm good. All right. I'll turn it back over to you, Ryan. Aaron, that's really kind of cool because, uh, as you know, you know, Mike Swanson um, is, you know, we did this tasting of the white whiskeys of all these different varieties. Some of those words are all the same. And his experience with Hazlitt is indeed that it's a really stable, nice, nothing out of the ordinary one for, for whiskey. And he, he's now doing something which he has a bunch of varietal whiskeys now. Um, and there's some really big surprises in there. When I did the taste test wine, well, they're not wine though. We didn't do a formal taste test. We just did three white whiskeys, each of us and had a whole bunch of people in the room. Um, the worst one I had was geraniums. And, and, you know, he mashed them all the same way, put them on the big still all the same way. There is indeed some of them in the grassy, what some people would probably refer to as cheap tequila uh, kind of uh, notes, which is all in that grass green kind of corner. And there's some that were in the citrusy corner. Some were in the Surprisingly, in the vanilla, which most people in whiskey think of as coming out of the barrel, out of the woods, but there were some that would say vanilla notes. So there's all kinds of funny things going on in all these different rye varieties. I find that believable. Not just big, I mean, I find it believable because of your comments and because of our, even our laboratory benchtop studies show big differences in constituents. You know, uh, at, you know, three full differences in f f three VG or, you know, two full differences in protein. Mike had to laugh when I called one, Jesus, this is like a geranium. And I'm not a chemist, so I have no idea what volatile that is that gives it a geranium on the head. Um, I have a question to follow up on that. 
Sure, go ahead, Brooke. Um, so if, if so, Nicole at MSU is going to be sending around six samples to expert tasters from the stuff that we grew this year, kind of similar to what you've had going on in Minnesota for a while, um, but you know, real real scale. So if you don't want a sample, say now. Otherwise, we'll probably send you one. <laughs> or I'll, I'll tell Nicole to send you one, and then we're going to age them too, and maybe send you one in a couple of years again. Well, you can't threaten us with a good time, Brooke. Um, <laughs> well, I show up for this happens. On that, um, I just I feel that these flavors, a lot of them come from fermentation. So, like, if if that's not exactly the same in every single scenario, yes, in a in a lab scale, you should be doing the same pitching rate and the same temperature and keeping all that consistent, but. These flavors, even the ferulic acid gets changed to 4VG and the way you mash it, you release the ferulic acid. So it's like all of these operating parameters are going to determine whether these flavors are going to come through or not. It might, I don't know how heavy it is on the variety versus the, the parameters in itself. I, 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 that's kind of what I want to know. And it's completely dependent on your yeast. Exactly. Completely and totally dependent on your yeast, whether you even see it or not, you know. But it's the thing I think about rye, though, it seems like when you're talking rye, everybody talks spicy. Yeah. And I do not know if I can taste spicy in the wort or not taste it in the wort and taste it in the beer. That to me, the, I don't know the answer to that question. Is it in the wort already? That would be good to know. If that well, spicy note is already in the wort, that'd be pretty good to know. Or do, do you we mean have spicy to... cloves or eugenol? Or do you mean spicy pepper? Hot. I mean, like, what spicy. do you mean? I mean, well, for me, for me, I don't get spicy cloves out of rye. I get spicy cloves out of any beer brewed with a, you know, a phenolic, you know, yeast. But I don't, I don't get spicy clove out of rye per se. I get more of a, a peppery spiciness that's what i get kind of more like a kind of i don't know more of a cinnamon type effect that's kind of my my feeling of it but no, it's, the, it's the spice cabinet uh thing that we've talked about it's that cute the same question we had about the culinary uh issue well, spice cabinet is just phenolic that's just plain old phenolic. that's something that's not good and I, I don't think people are looking for that i know well, I i'm agree. not i that. agree but but if rye is for flavor, then we need to be able to, you know, be able to literally get this, uh, the varieties into much larger uh, sensories. But, but as Nicole pointed out, is, there's the technical aspects of it, which are also changing the flavor. So you kind of, the, the, the impact and the economics are, there's going to be a there's gonna be significant and sustained demand for rye for brewing and distilling. It's going to be in the, if there's no top choice, uh, then any variety is the top choice. And that's, I think that's where it's going to have to end up, that we're going to have to make it some decisions. Does anyone, um, has anyone worked with Jacob Laney, and sorry if I'm mispronouncing their names, or Keith Cadwalder at Virginia Tech? So I reached out to them because I wanted to know kind of, because I saw that they're doing rye stuff and they volunteered to, they do have this like, very enhanced olfactory sensory of rye that they've been looking at. And he asked and is interested in seeing the low wines versus uh, the finished product and looking at um, what he can pick up. So he offered to do that and I'm going to send him some stuff too. So that might help to at least give an idea of if, if really any of these varieties are inherently different after fermentation or after distillation. And like Liz said, the distilling process itself like you have to understand you know where these volatiles are coming out and if you miss them you miss them and then you just end up losing them in in like the tails or the the heads fraction and understanding what kind of still and you know processing for that too is dependent too right to do in that in those big grow outs was, that was one of the reasons we went using on the big still rather than using a small still uh, and doing it in the same uh, same mash every single time, same combinations, 
trying to keep as much of that consistent as possible. Um, you know, Mike isn't a researcher the way I like to do replication umpteen times. And then, you know, because it, it's, you know, you run masses like that every single time. It takes time and money. And, you know, that it's it, in a way that this whole thing started for us as, as exploratory. One of the things that in the back of my, my mind sits is, you know, with both the heads and the tails, the genetics of an OP is that it's a population of a whole bunch of different genotypes. They're somewhat related and they kind of look alike. Uh, you know, you can recognize a Wheeler, a field of Wheeler compared to a field of Danko. But within that, the genetics are such that we can have huge variability between individual plants for any of the other attributes because we don't, we never selected for them. The hybrids are genetically much more narrower. And so they're, they're much more homogeneous for some of these traits because the number of plants that contributed ultimately to making that hybrid is many, many fewer uh, that made the parent, the male and the female in, in the hybrid. And so when it comes to concentrations, my guess is you would have, simply if I look at genetics, you would have a much more defined signature on the hybrids absence of presence compared to the OPs, which might, you know, some of those signals might be very, very faint simply because it's only one or 2% of the plants or the grain in a sample that carried those genetics. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'd like to point out too that there's need, there's work needed on uh, the lexicon of flavor descriptors too. So we're all speaking the same language here. Spicy, what does that mean? Um, right. But so, uh, so, so Ryan, I actually am doing trying to do that right now. So there's this 2000 publication out of um, Scotland with the flavor wheel for whiskey uh, that I'm have to modify because we didn't mature them all the way to, and uh, you know, so I'm, I'm doing my best in, in those six broad categories. And then the, and I have to translate this because we didn't train these people. Mm -hmm. We just went blind into it and kind of what they, but it's, it's a funny how indeed some of these words, I don't have to do any translation. The tequila green, you know, a green to me, I have to translate probably to grass, which is one of the char char characters in that in uh, one of the lines in the in those flavor wheels. Yeah, it. In some ways, there's you know we run into snags where there's miscommunication, but it is really surprising and, and uh, encouraging when we do run into to commonalities independently uh, for sensory stuff. Uh, but we have. Tons more questions in the chat. Um, and there's two from Mike Davis. So I'll just uh, ask you to unmute Mike so you can just ask him live. Sure, first for Paul. Uh, in processing is, is how is rye different than uh, wheat and barley at processing for malt? Uh, well, you know, the way, the way I process rye is is different than um someone commercial um why not commercial i mean obviously obviously it's an issue with both wheat and rye is um you know the the bushel weight um, you get in the steep they pack a lot tighter if you're not careful you can have issues um issues there um i think there was a Oh, who was that at Brees years ago? Marianne Gruber. I don't know if you remember remember her. I remember her. Mm -hmm. But um, there was an article in Brewer's Digest interviewing her, and she said um, whenever they malted uh, rye at Brees was when she was going to take vacation because there were always <laughs> always some <laughs> issues. But um, you know, I'll I'll ask others to chime in. What we found. You know, on the micro malt side, we some of the quality parameter parameters were a little bit better if we went an extra day of germination. 
So our normal micromalt is four. With the rise, we went to five. Um, we found too that some of the parameters like extract, if you steeped to a little higher moisture, those improved. But when I talked to some of the craft maltsters, they said, you know, going to a higher steep moisture with rye, you know, in a non micro malt situation gives you a big sticky mess. So, um, you know, basically what, you know, the observation that, that we had on the micro scale is a little bit longer germination time. Um, what I've heard from, you know, people on the craft side is uh, basically handling. Um, I think Andrea mentioned to me that, um, and Ryan maybe kind of indicated, rye tends to pack. Um, and she talked about having to go in and fluff it periodically to, to get decent airflow. And even on the micro scale too, we found in, in kilning, there's a lot of, um, it, it sh compared to barley, we get a lot of shrinkage to the point we weren't getting good airflow through that, that small grain mass, but I'll, I'll stop with that. Well, good. I'm going to uh, go to agronomics real quick for, for Yoakum. And Yoakum, just want to talk a little bit about the tail end, dry down and differences between uh, rye and wheat and barley. Uh, Michigan has similar environments, part of it that I have here on Washington Island and, and growing some barley, want to grow some rye. So the dry down quicker, slower, uh, ideal moisture level, does it, how about sprouting, is, is that a problem? And then storing it. So a little bit about the, the, the tail end of it and getting it in the bin and, and keeping it stable. Challenges with the rye is that the old piece, especially if their the seed has been around forever, they tend to diverge a little bit. So they're a little bit not as uniform and that makes cutting time a little bit more challenging. Um, the hybrids, I treat the hybrids like I treat my, treat my winter wheat. Um, once you're at 18%, I go. Um, but with the, with the OPs, I, I, didn't, I might have some plants yet that are relatively green yet. Um, now in my plots, that is never a problem, but treat, Rye the way you would treat wheat, which means don't start before 18% grain moisture with the combine. Uh, the tall ones, Wheeler, uh, Spooner, in your environment, your you know your niche there, my guess would be they collapse, and then you have a mess on the ground, um, which it I, I have not seen sprouting yet. Um, that doesn't mean that I have a good rating on a good hand on it. I just haven't seen it, even though I've had plots lay on the ground flat uh, before harvest. I can't tell you that much, but I treat it like I treat winter wheat, which is when it's 18%, I go. Yeah, my farm in Connecticut, uh, we do uh, we were, we do winter rye for a cover crop and I don't know about sprouting because uh, once it's ripe, uh, we just lightly disc it in again and we, we have another crop in fields that, you know, we're not doing anything with. So just was so, curious about so, that. Does anyone else have any experience on, on rye? Is it? Uh... So rye will have a high temperature dormancy. It's one of the reasons why rye is a weed in the Southern, uh, Southern Plains. Um, so if you go to Texas Panhandle, parts of Oklahoma, rye is basically almost the number one wheat in winter wheat because it's hard, well, once rye is in there, it's hard to get it out. Um, there's high temperature dormancy. So that probably tells me that it's probably pretty tolerant to pre-harvest sprout because there's a correlation there. Yet it has slow falling numbers. Yeah, but that's intrinsic in alpha amylase. Well, there's, with there's always some free alpha amylase, even in winter wheat. Yes. Um, 
you know, in, in, in spring wheat without actually having sprout. And, and what, what is a, a reasonable falling number value for rye? I mean, you can't, simply take the uh, the the value that we use for, for wheat because the matrix is a little bit different. Very true. Um, yeah, we've gone through that with barley as well. I mean, that's why we settle on RVA, stirring number. Um, but, uh, there's a question from a distiller in the chat um, and I'm going to summarize. Um, so most distillers will use unmalted grains to do a cereal mash, um, but he's curious about how malting is going to affect the, affect the flavor in rye versus using a raw rye. And um, I noticed um, Liz Rhodes is on the call. So if Liz, if you feel like being picked on, feel free to, to talk about this if you have some insights, otherwise it's, it's open to anyone. Wow. Hello. <laughs> Hi, Liz. Hey, Liz, because I'm out. I'm no idea. Yeah, it's I mean, it's a good question. Um, I think personally, from my perspective, I don't know if I've done the direct correlation, um, you know, looking at an unmalted and malted and, and you know, doing a, a, a whiskey um, side by side or distillate side by side. Um, so, so I would say that's, I mean, a great question. Um, again, like from my experience, since I haven't done the, the, the direct correlation, I don't know if I can comment too much. Yeah, I, I don't have a clear answer either, mo like most things. <laughs> but One thing I could share from our lab bench is, we, although we've never looked at rye and malted rye, when we do mashing, uh, comparing 100% rye grain um, mash bills with enzymes, obviously, raw, this would be raw, uh, we see about a 30%, 25 to 30% increase in 4VG potential if you include up to 10% malt, malted barley, right? So we find that 90% raw rye with 10% malted barley gives us more 4VG than just with the rye itself. And that's not coming from the malt, actually, because the levels of like for VG in like a hundred percent malt barley uh, mash or very uh, fermentation are very low. So there's something synergistic happening about the enzymes, I think coming from the malted barley, helping us maybe with the enzymatic conversion release of the fruit acid or something. So mm -hmm. I don't know, malting comes into play and we definitely see an advantage in terms of that particular character. If you use include some barley malt in the mash. Nick. Nice. I guess a follow up question to that. So f from a percentage standpoint, I think um, that's that's great to see that that visual because I know you've shared that graph with me. Um, how does that relate because I'm trying to correlate this back to the question in terms of uh, sensory. Do you know how that correlates back to a PPM level. No. Okay. <laughs> no, not in sensor. Like we're just measuring, we're measuring, you know, you've seen our charts, a lot of our charts yeah. is because I've shared them with you. And now that data is starting to get out there a little bit more. It's in the Brooks publication. So we're measuring, we're measuring, we, um, we're just measuring it in, in milligrams per liter in the fermented wash. So we're not trying to convert it back to a grain basis. We're just trying at this point to, look for a way that we could measure differences across varietals or across treatments. Um, frankly, I'm, more, I'm most excited about pairing that when the coals work, right? Where we actually have new make spirits made from these grains. Mm. Um, that, that's where we meet, frankly, that's the next big step. One, is, is it even the right chemical flavor marker for the sensory characteristics that people want? And then again, different distillers want want different sensory characteristics in their whiskeys. That's why there's so much diverse whiskey out there. Um, yeah, I, so I, I can't wait to get a sniff or not so much me, but to have someone like you sniff these things and say, okay, is this, what, uh, you know, how does it line up? I think that's the next step. We have to pair the, the lab analytics with some yeah. pilot 
scale production or the work that uh, that Yoakum and his, uh, the distillery he's working with out there are doing. You, you've got to take it all the way eventually to see if we have predictive metrics. Otherwise, we're just measuring things for the hell of it. Yeah, I think, I think from that perspective, I mean, you could always compare it back to sensory thresholds, but to that point, there's always going to be, you know, some sort of matrix effect. Um, there's, of course, always the 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 person to person effect. Um, so, I I mean, simply comparing it to the sensory threshold, uh, to your point, I mean, it's it's not the full picture. So, yeah. So I'm the distiller that uh, asked that question. So I appreciate you guys all taking a stab at it. And unfortunately, everyone I've talked to before doesn't know the answer to that either. So I use a lot of rye. Um, and some people that I talk to that use malted rye say it tastes spicier or peppier. And other people will say unmalted tastes pepperier. Um, but the problem is, is, like you guys have been talking about, there's lots of different varieties of rye. They all come from different areas. It's, not, it's an apples to oranges comparison. And um, it'd be really interesting to actually take the same rye and malt that rye and then compare it. Um, but anyway, thanks for taking a stab at it. Well, Joel, what are the what are your customers demanding for rye? What are they? What's the what? What does someone walk in your door? What are they asking for? Um, I mean, people obviously like rye. I mean, rye is actually my my favorite type of whiskey. I make I use a lot of rye. I make a lot of rye whiskey. Um, but I mean, obviously people that like rye, like, like that kind of that, uh, you know, that the edge, the, you know, the edge on the flavor, the pepperiness, um, just, I think it's more floral, um, you know, it's just, I think more complex than something like bourbon, which is mostly corn. I can you see it all, all the people like, is that the edge? Is that what you mean by the edge? The astringency, I'm just wondering, I'm yeah, just trying yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, they just like, you yeah. know, the, the, the I don't know, harshness is not the right word because you don't like your whiskey. Oh. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Uh, you want you want it kind of like to you know stick stick you somewhere. So message received. I I will just comment just because Nicole. Sorry to interrupt. Just because Nicole uh, mentioned Jacob Lonnie's work uh, earlier in this talk, and actually Jacob Lonnie just I think it was maybe late in 2019. Um, he had a publication out comparing. Um, rye whiskey and bourbon from a sensory perspective and whether or not those particular class and types made a difference on sensory. Um, so that's it was actually an interesting paper and I think the conclusion was that it didn't really matter. <laughs> but you have to understand, I mean, as all of you know, there's so many variables to consider. Um, but I mean, going back to rye whiskey versus bourbon from a from a technical, from a regulation perspective, okay, bourbon, at least 51% corn, rye whiskey, at least 51% rye. So you could see how there's, could be only a few percentages <laughs> difference, right? <laughs> so I just thought I'd share that. Um, it's an interesting paper regardless. So I would recommend that to anyone to, to take a peruse. <laughs> So as a complete outsider and just a guy that now and then drinks whiskey, um, the things I've learned so far, just talking to Mike at Far North, is I think each of you that do this have a tremendous amount of what I call, what the Germans would call fingerspitzengefühl or you know organic memory of what works and doesn't work and does can't necessarily quantify what that is uh, all the time and so if you were trained by somebody uh, you know on a big still that says this is where you start and this is where you stop on on your heads and your tails okay how did you learn that um, you know, it, there, there is that finger speech in the fool that we now are trying to quantify of how that, that translate actually into a finished product. And there's like Aaron pointed out, those correlations, I think are not well established or if they're established, they're in house and nobody talks about them. Um, it, it's interesting 
because one of the comments Mike made was was very interesting. He said the one that I thought was absolutely the worst out of the mash and then out of the mash into the still and out of the still uh, white and then into one of the barrels, he said, by the time I didn't have any hopes for that one, for him, because he's comparing everything to Haslip because he's worked with Haslip since 2000. 13 now and he opened up that you know that barrel after the same amount of time with everybody all the other ones and went oh this is cool and and i think that's you know for all and i'm just a bystander but those kinds of comments and then including what you're saying now is i think the interesting part where if it's known, it's known in-house and nobody's talking about it. And for all the rest of us, we're all trying to learn as we go. And it's indeed not in the literature. I think that's a lot of what makes this work so exciting too, right? Uh, because it's a wide open field um, and we can all pursue our interests as we see fit and kind of define where this is going. Um, Tom, hearkening back to, to malting rye in the malt house, we found success with um, high pH steep liquor. So bolstering the pH of our steep liquor uh, using calcium hydroxide or slaked lime. Um, and that seemed to kind of curtail some of the gelling that occurs in germination with rye, at least um, the variety we were working with, which was Wheeler or possibly variety not stated because they're kind of synonymous in Michigan. Um, if it's yellow, it's Wheeler. Oh, okay. Wheeler is the only one that it has really a yellow color to it. All the other ones are going to be from green to almost a blue hue. So far, the only one I've seen that is yellow is Wheeler. No. Um, so... Well, um, we're at about an hour and a half, and that seems to be our sweet spot. But we do have time for more questions. So, if you know, if we have more statements and questions uh, to be had, please do. Um, but I would like everyone to know that next week's speaker will be Dr. Nicole Schreiner. Um, so we can continue this line of conversation next week as well um, from an analytical standpoint um, and expand from there too. So she'll be giving us updates about her, her analytical lab in East Lansing. And it's going to be a lot of fun. All right, so, and I'll try to answer Jeffrey, uh, Jeffrey's question about is anybody working with the newly developed perennial grains? So in, in Minnesota, uh, you know, we work on Kernza. Uh, intermediate wheatgrass. Um, there are, you know, Patagonia has, uh, together with, I forgot the brewer now on the, on the West Coast, made the IPA with uh, Kernza. They are also working, I believe, with Far North Spirits to see if they can um, make whiskey out of the Kernza. I think that project, they're starting that up, if I'm not mistaken. So yes, uh, people are working also on those. Um, looks like we have another question from Tom um, about mashing um, with malted rye versus a malted rye with raw rye in concert. Um, can you get both a good beer as well as a good whiskey uh, with a combination of raw and malted barley? Some people um, use raw barley for added head retention because of a higher protein, I think. Um, but I think you sacrifice some of the enzyme power when you don't use it. So you got to make sure you're covering your ass in that way. But that's all I know about using raw barley and beer. Oh, and you got to cook it. Yeah, that too. And you're going to be in for a nightmare of laddering um yep. so yeah brian misread the question the question is uh can i get uh the same type of spiciness using malted barley along with raw 
rye as I can with malted rye. Um, I, I think the answer is we don't know. It depends. <laughs> Always the answer. <laughs> well, and on malted rye, right? The ferulic acid precursors to 4VG that we're, we seem to be after haven't been released from the Arabinose island or Penisan polymers, right? So there's less, for, less ferulic acid made available for the yeast to act upon to convert into 4VG. Doesn't have to be malted though, Ryan, because even if we I, even if we have no malted grains in there, there's some of that frulic acid esterase endogenous in the unmalted rye itself. Paul, what do you think? Uh, well, you have some free frulic acid anyway. Uh, most of it, most of it is bound or it's it's bound insoluble or bound soluble. Um, in the unmalted rye. You know, and you're mashing with barley. I would, if that was the question, I would mash in at a little lower temperature to to get the you know the esterase activity. I, I seem to recall the the ger hearing you know Germans talk about a, a ferulic um, acid es or esterase rest. Yeah, that's um, my experience. That's common. We have a lot in brewing school specifically. Yeah. yeah. It's like super too. low though, right? At like 45, 50 C. Max. Yeah, 43. Yep. Sorry, my dog's going nuts. <laughs> um, and Michael's wondering uh, where sources for heritage rye varieties might be found. Michael, can I ask you what you mean in this case with heritage? Yeah, I guess this would be. Uh, you know, again, forgive me for being my land race original. Uh, here, uh, just a notable here in Michigan, uh, the the Dutch community has a they they like their rye, and they look for very specific rye varieties to make their very specific rye bread. I lived in Germany for several years and was always fascinated by the different rye breads, but. They were they were seriously different rye rise uh, not, not a, uh, for other reasons than we should talk about I'm not a big fan of rye beer anymore but um, I, I just was wondering where the uh, cultural origins are so if you know rye has been a stable lot longer in Northern European countries. And Michael, if you indeed had that rye bread that has the density of a concrete brick for breakfast, uh, you basically were in my neck of the woods because that's what I grew up on. Um, the, the unfortunate thing is in the US, any of the older rye varieties have completely disappeared. I could only grab back to finding seed for Renza Bruzi because it was still used as a cover crop and Renza Bruzi goes the 63 or 64 release out of University of Georgia, University of Florida. Um, and then right away, I'm jumping into the 70s, you know, with Wheeler Spooner, which are already improved from whatever populations were out there. Um, I can ask some uh, KWS, if they have still in their seed repository, some of the really old stuff. Likewise, Danko has been in this game a long, long time. And there actually is a couple of what everybody here calls Danko that are actually different Danko numbers because the polls at the time only would release Danko with a number behind it. And they probably made it across at some time, whether they ended up in Quebec or somewhere on in the Northeast. Danko 39 is probably the most famous, but I think they had them all the way up to 54, which I wouldn't be surprised if some of them that are sold under Danko now are actually one of those numbers. Uh, there's some really cool papers out of Finland on milling quality 
and, and some German papers on melancholy, where they talk about some other older genetics. Um, but I have not been able to find those. There is a lot of talk if you go on, on the internet about, because I had to, I was trying to find all these different varieties um, where certain things are called heritage, but when you actually do the search, uh, they're a variety out of Finland that was released in 1975. Okay, that's not heritage by well, no, you're just anywhere we're, in my we're definition. Not old. Is that what it is? We're, go like, just, I'm, we're not old. That would put me in the category of ancient and, you know. Yeah, right. I went to the seed, I went to the site for the seed bank or whatever, where they keep all the <clears throat> seed. There's 1900 varieties of, of cereal rye <clears throat> in that list. Very few of them have much information with them. You know, there's a lot of country of origin and, you know, a lot of it's um, European origins, but there, there was, there's 1900 of them listed there. I don't know how you sort through that, but. Get a really big grant because you're going to get only about five grams. And so before you can do yep. any work on them, you're gonna have a couple of years and you have to do it all in isolation, mm -hmm. uh, blowing them up, and then you can have start having fun. Dean, by the way, beautiful Dutch name. Oh, thank you, 100%. You ain't much if you ain't Dutch. <laughs> Oh, if it was only the first time I'd heard that one. <laughs> yeah, you you live in Grand Rapids. Yeah, the 19th century saw a lot of uh, people from the Netherlands immigrating here over to West Michigan. Yeah, I've got nice hey, flat farmland. Hey, Paul, is um, is ND Gardner available now? Yeah, Did they release that. Yeah, it's it's available. I would call it also a du dual purpose variety. It, it's not to me, Steve might disagree with me, but it, it's more cover crop potential, I think, than a grain crop. Uh, you yeah. bring it out west, it's going to get tall in a hurry. Yeah, when when I asked you guys to, to um, classify the rise, you, there were a few you disagreed on. We tried to get some from Carrington and never got a good response from them on getting getting some to plant in our trials here in Michigan. I did drop the uh, well, I dropped a ton of things in the chat, but uh, one of those is our, our rye trial results too, which are, are pretty interesting, and um, and very in parallel with what Yoakum has going on there. Um, yeah, it's funny because I even made the uh, the same height joke uh, that I, I was like, ah, I'm 6'4", look how tall this rye is. And no, I'm just kidding, I'm 5'8", but the rye was still very tall. There was actually a sandhill crane during when we were filming out there. I don't know if you remember that, Dean, but um, there was a sandhill crane lurking in the rye plots, making its sandhill crane noises and uh, yeah, we couldn't see it and it didn't care that we were there. But, uh, so yeah, good bird habitat, apparently. Hey, Ryan, just a quick note. Next, uh, Chris Cap just sent data on ergot alkaloids and Don and uh, Colonel assortment yesterday, maybe. So we'll try to get that out there in addition to what's already on that publication soon. Oh, excellent. Cool. Very cool. Um, and then uh, Jeff in the chat um, is, uh, if anyone's interested in uh, collaborative grant writing um, for what we've been talking about or giant pumpkins or uh, a lot of different things. Um, yeah, he's open to collaboration on that. So I thought I'd give him a plug on that one.
All right. Um, any further questions or shall we continue this conversation next week? Yeah, you're welcome, Jeff. All right. Uh, well, cheers, everyone. I am out of whiskey, so it's just water, but you know, that's okay. Cheers. <laughs> oh, awesome session. And thank you, everyone, for attending. Thanks a lot, Paul and Joachim. Um, yeah, it's been Thanks for the opportunity. Yep. Thank you. Talk to you guys next week. Yeah. Okay. Cheers, everyone. Bye, Ryan.